Hey guys, this is Stevie Nicks, a female 2016 proven um, Hypo Sunset Outcross Northern produced by Austin out of skinkoides.com. And um, I hope to breed her this coming season. She's already produced one litter for someone else and I got lucky enough to get a hold of her and hopefully she is gonna breed with Kezia this season. And today I wanna talk to you about breeding, not how to, but should you? With whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Hi, I'm TC Houston, former professional zookeeper, lifelong reptile fanatic, and blue tongue skink breeder. And this is Reptile Mountain TV, evidence based, captive bred, and animal focused. Okay, guys, so to start it off, I want to give a shout out to Mariah over at Reptifiles. Reptifiles is a blog, I'm gonna put the link down in the description, that is good information about reptiles and current topics. And one of those topics that Mariah wrote about was breeding. I believe it's called the birds, the beer, bees, and beardies, um, whether or not to breed or breeding responsibly. And she has this great flow chart and decision making on whether or not someone should breed. Now she's pretty adamant against breeding for money and I understand that. Um, I'm not in the same boat with her on that. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit more, but I think Mariah, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Guys, go check out that blog. It is totally underrated. Spread that blog around because it's good stuff. Um, so today we're gonna talk about purpose and process, the two constructs in breeding. So purpose is the why breed, and the process is exactly the method and the manner in which we breed, and they're very closely interwoven. The answering of the question, why? Why breed? So it could be many different things. It could be that the animals are rare and that the captive population of these animals actually depends on people to breed them. For example, maybe wild specimens are no longer available. Maybe they're extinct in the wild or it's limited availability or restricted based on conservation, which is a good thing that there's restriction from bringing things in from the wild, but it also puts a um, kind of a, a, a need on breeding in captivity. For example, our Australian blue tongue skinks and Australian animals in general, they're not allowed to be exported, whether captive bred or wild collected from Australia anymore. And it's been since the 80s that that's been uh, a ban. So that means every Australian animal outside of the United, or out of Australia in the United States and worldwide that's not in Australia, um, they are literally one generation away from being extinct in captivity, if you will, at least outside of Australia. And that captive populations are dependent on captive breeding, otherwise those species won't exist in captivity in those areas outside of Australia because they don't export. So it's limited access. So that could be one of the reasons, is breeding to ensure that they are around for other people. Then it could be that they are, maybe they're actually endangered and that you're ble breeding for global existence, for the animal to actually be around for future generations to even see and enjoy. I wish that that had been the case with the thylacine because I really want to see a thylacine or golden toads. Um, that would have been amazing to be able to see some. Those just recently went extinct, which is really sad. Um, and then it could be, maybe they're just super common, um, but they're popular, and so lots of people do it just for recreation. Uh, and then other reasons that people breed, uh, why breed? Maybe you're trying to reduce the stress on a wild population. So people are collecting from the wild, taking from the wild, and ideally we would take from the wild once and then be able to sustain it in captivity and not make the wild our constant source of animals for our own personal enjoyment and in the hobby. The wild should not be a constant flow, like it is in many cases, which is not a good conservation method. So I recommend breeding for the purpose of taking that pressure off of the wild population, which is what some people do. So that's a lot of folks who are trying to breed Irian Jaya blue tongues and Tannenbars and Marukis and uh, Indonesians, including the Halmahara. The, all of those um, skinks are constantly being imported and then the farm raised, that just means someone owns land and they collected it off their personal land, not public land. That's in some cases, that's all that farm raised means. It's still wild collected and taking from nature. So um, ideally we would have them bred in captivity. That's one purpose for breeding. Um, other purposes are like breeding for color. 
breeding to get something very pretty that's attractive and enjoyable to look at. And that's very common in the ball python industry. And it's also growing in popularity and certain color variations in the blue tongue skink community, both polygenic in the United States and um, uh, direct recessive or direct genetic in uh, the term of morphs in Australia. That's pretty cool. And then another reason that people breed is for money. Now I will say this about money. Almost every breeder I know sells their animals. They don't give them away for free. And, they, and usually that is just to make enough money to sustain themselves and their hobby. Um, and some people maybe make a little bit more. I will say this. If money is your priority, you need to get out of the business. You need to get out of the hobby. If money is your priority. Now, if you have a passion for these animals and animal welfare comes first, second, and third, and then money comes into play, then it's okay. I, I and in my opinion, I fully discourage seeking profit at the expense or exploitation of a living animal. I believe that the priority always should be the best and premium animal welfare and at any time when that is compromised including if i do it it's time to hang it up and get out of the business because you are in it for the wrong reasons and you're running a high risk of becoming a reptile mill and you're running a high risk of kind of being um you know the behavior of a scumbag it's kind of scumbaggery and that's not cool so um but that kind of brings us into the process. So we talk about purpose as why and the process of how we do it. And that includes animal welfare. So we're gonna talk about process now. The process, the manner in which you breed. So as a breeder, you are genuinely bona fide, legitimately responsible for facilitating the existence of these new lives or life, depending on how many animals you're breeding. You are bringing an animal, a, a genuine life, into existence or facilitating that existence. So their entire lives are in part due to you, the breeder, or me, the breeder. Which means that the welfare of not just the baby, but the baby who grows into a juvenile, who grows into a sub-adult, who becomes an adult, all rests on the shoulders of the breeder. Now, a good breeder, then you have produced them and you haven't just blindly sold them to whoever uh, whoever will buy. It's not like you're doing this and say, give me some money. I mean, I hope that's not what you're doing, but you're actually being a good steward and ensuring that your welfare care for the animal is then passed on to the next person. That is the exact reason why I started the this YouTube channel is the very reason that I got my website and put a care sheet on it and spend a lot of time helping people um, care for their animals because I believe that the more educated people are the more that education gets spread around it saturates in and people's animals get to thriving and that is my goal that's my heart's desire and, and in part, I feel responsible as a breeder for ex especially the ones that I helped facilitate creation of. You know, the, these little babies that wouldn't exist had I not paired these animals together and raised these little babies. So there is definitely some significant responsibility in uh, the breeder's hands. And therefore, researching is absolutely paramount. And I don't mean just researching about the care of the animal or the overall um, husbandry. I mean the uh, research of where are these animals going. So if you're breeding just to breed up your own stock, you know, you're just going to breed and keep all the babies for yourself because you love them. And then you're going to do it again. And you just want a bazillion skinks in your house. You know that's cool if you have the resources and the ability to care for them properly and they have pinnacle welfare um, and that the number of animals does not cause compromise of care then go for it do that all you want if you intend to have these animals bred and then sold um, then you really need to look into the market you need to ensure that there are buyers available not only um, available like there's people out there that could buy it because they have cash but they want it and it's a desirable animal um, because it is very tragic to go to a reptile show and see a plethora of a specific type of animal and yeah they might have different variables as far as genetics but after a while they all start to look quite almost the same to me 
and I'm not gonna say what exactly is overflowing at every show because I would say I could say ball pythons but that would be unfair right because everyone knows there's no ball pythons at any expo right and a little dig at my ball python friends seriously some markets are absolutely saturated and ball pythons is getting close to it and in some cases is overflowing saturated and so we have to look at the market it's a responsibility thing because you don't want to be pouring gasoline onto a fire if there are animals that aren't being sold for a whole year for, so you go to someone's website right or you look and they've been this animal has been posted for sale and it's still available a year later you gotta wonder why, especially if it's not just one animal, but multiples of the same kind, and they're still available a year later. Um, you know, breeders have last year's babies, and they're not holdbacks. They've just been for sale the whole time, and now they have this year's babies for sale too. Wow, that means something. It means there's not enough buyers. It's starting to show that the market is getting very close to saturated. Um, and so catching on to that is really important. That's part of the research and going, hmm, maybe I shouldn't breed that particular animal because if he can't sell his, what makes me think that I can sell mine? Okay, um, so we have to think about that, especially if it's not like something different. Obviously, if someone's selling mite-ridden, parasite-infested animals and it's the seller that's the problem, not the animal species, that's one thing. But if they are genuinely selling a good quality, healthy animal and you have a good quality, healthy animal and they can't sell theirs, what makes you think you're gonna sell yours? Um, marketing only takes you so far. If there's no buyers, there's no buyers right so that's something that's very important to research other things is like researching genetics looking at to what can um, be a, a detriment understanding breeding uh, and and trying to avoid in uh, inbreeding if at all possible now when you're breeding for morphs I understand breeding uh, inbreeding uh, is almost mandatory uh, to some extent but you can minimize it with a little bit of preparation and a little bit of patience so I personally will not breed sibling to sibling unless they are the last two animals on earth that's just my own personal policy I went to um, you know I've taken uh, wildlife genetics and I've taken uh, regular genetics both in zoology and the university level uh, and, and and of course I've learned a little bit about ball python genetics but what I have learned is that inbreeding does definitely bring out some of the genetic flaws and increases uh, the likelihood of, of animals to, uh, there's a squirrel, literally squirrel, <laughs> right there about to jump on me. Anyway, um, siblings, you don't, you, I mean, you're concentrating the genetics and that kind of can bring out some of the genetic um, defects. I can also bring out some of the morphs. I don't really want this squirrel to jump on me. Um, and so you know you got to be careful I don't do it personally there is a way if you had an albino male you got two female normals you breed them to both female normals if they were unrelated then you have half siblings half siblings is significantly better than full siblings um, even sibling to parent is better than full siblings because you've got two concentrated doses of the same same and you want to try and avoid that as much as possible um, please don't get in a rush just to make the next big thing or to make the cash remember that the that what we have and what we do today does have a ripple effect down the line Line. that's what we've seen consistently in the ball python industry is when people get into a rush um, they will breed and some animals will actually uh, suffer greatly physically or um, overall in their welfare pretty dramatically some may not even survive some are just in low survivability some just suffer their whole life some have to be culled and there's a whole nother ethical uh, thing about culling which means to, to actually um, euthanize animals that are not uh, desirable and so and that can be for a plethora of reasons but basically guys when we're breeding we have to take some responsibility for what we're doing it is not something that you just do on a whim and a prayer okay and, and, and I, I believe that that's most of you out there that you totally want to do the right thing do your research do not jump on me squirrel back off I'm not kidding this you see that did you see it I don't know if you saw it there's a squirrel I think you heard it so I'm not crazy if I am NOT here tomorrow it was cuz I died of a squirrel attack but yeah process well guys thank you for watching and I will catch you on another episode and remember opinion is not fact